Uh, so again, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization board meeting of November 19th of 2020. Uh, before we begin, I ask for your patience as I read our official uh, notice into the record um, saying that pursuant to the declared state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Virginia in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to protect the public health safety and welfare of our board members, staff, and the general public, uh, today's HRTPO board meeting is being held electronically via Zoom. Uh, these electronic meetings are required to complete the essential business of the TPO on behalf of our region. Uh, per the requirements of the Code of Virginia, we posted today's meeting notice, agenda, and supporting documentation on our organization's website for review by the general public. We also provide electronic copies of this information to our board members and other interested parties. A recording of today's meeting is being made and will be posted on the HRTPO website. Uh, additionally, uh, we're excited that we've begun to live stream our meetings. Today's meeting is being live streamed so that your uh, residents, your constituents can watch these proceedings live. Um, and then we'll be available for viewing on our regional connection, which is our YouTube channel. Uh, the general public was provided an opportunity to provide comments on today's meeting agenda via two options. They could submit comments to you via email. They were also invited to call in comments to a dedicated phone line. Uh, no public comments were received uh, for the deadline in advance of this meeting. Uh, so just real quickly, um, as we begin today's meeting, a couple of reminders. Number one, again, we ask everybody to remain on mute until uh, Chair Tuck uh, recognizes you for input. Um, and I forget to do this sometimes, but after speaking, please go back on mute. Uh, and if not, uh, we have staff that will give you a quick reminder on that. Uh, important to identify yourself before you speak by providing your name. And also, should you provide a motion or a second, it's very helpful if you provide your name. And then again, I apologize for this, but all votes that we take today must be taken uh, via roll call. So um, thank you so much again on behalf of our staff. Always appreciate your dedication to our region and to our work. So with that, Mayor Tuck, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll forward the proceedings over to you, sir. Uh, Mayor, you're on mute. I apologize. You have to unmute, sir. Um, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. You're um, you're you're shown on mute. Uh, Logan, can, there we go. Should be. Okay, I was actually using my phone as a backup, just in case something happened to my internet. Right. Yeah, thank okay. you for planning ahead, sir. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay, <laughs> okay no you, problem. Sir. That said, um, I want to call the meeting of November 19th, 2020 to order and ask for a motion and second to approve the agenda as presented. John Rowe, so moved. William Harrell, Thanks. second. Any questions or discussion? I'd like to ask Mr. Crum to call the roll, please. Yes, and this roll will serve, of course, not only as approval of the agenda, but this will be our attendance uh, uh, roll call for today's meeting as well. So if you're present and um, also if you approve the motion in the second, Please indicate by uh, set, set in, indicating so. Uh, let's start with Chesapeake, Mayor West. Yes. Uh, to Franklin, Mayor Raybill. Aye. To Gloucester County, Mr. Bazzani. Yes. Uh, to the City of Hampton, Mayor Tuck. Aye. To Isle of Wight County, Mr. McCarty. Uh, Mr. McCarty from Isle White, is there an alternate present from Isle White County? Let's move on to James City County, Mr. Hipple. Mr. Hipple. Let's move on to Newport News. Aye. Oops, thank you, Mr. Hipple. Let's move on to Newport News, Mayor Price. Uh, Dave Jenkins for Mayor Price, aye. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jenkins. On to the city of Norfolk, Mayor Alexander. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, the city of Pocosin, uh, Mr. Green. Aye. 
On to the city of Portsmouth, Mayor Rowe. Aye. Southampton County, Mr. Gillette. Mr. Gillette. Uh, on to the city of Suffolk, Mayor Johnson. Mayor Johnson, uh, is there a alternate for the city of Suffolk today? On to the city of Virginia Beach, Mayor Dyer. Yes. Thank you, sir. On to Williamsburg, Mayor Pons. Aye. Thank you. On to York County, Mr. Shepard. Aye. HRT, Mr. Harrell. Aye. Uh, Williamsburg Area Transit, Mr. Trogdon. Yes. On to VDOT, Mr. Hall. Yes. On to DRPT, Ms. DeBrule. Yes. For the Virginia Port Authority, Ms. Vick. Anybody from VPA today? On to our General Assembly members, Senator Locke. Senator Locke. Senator Sproul. Senator Sproul. Delegate Heretic. Mr. Delegate. And Delegate Ward. Yes. Thank you, Delegate. Mr. Mahaley, does the motion pass? Uh, Mr. Mahaley, does the motion carry? Um, some video yes. difficulties. Yes, thank you. But uh, Mr. Sorry. Chairman, I'm going to say the motion carries. Thank you so much. Great, and thank you. And that brings us to agenda item number three, the executive director report. Mr. Thank you, sir. Um, for the HRTPO board members, uh, my monthly uh, executive director's report is included in your agenda mailing. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. The one item that I did want to report on for you today, um, you will recall that some of the uh, legislation created by the Virginia General Assembly, particularly in the extended session in April, required the HRTPO to establish a regional transit advisory panel. Uh, this was a requirement of our TPO in partnership with the new uh, dedicated regional funding source for transit to support the HRT system and required us to bring together a broad based uh, panel people from the business community and the healthcare industry and our educational institutions and major employers and retail establishments as well as prescribing a number of other important community stakeholders uh, that are required to be on that panel. Uh, your action in July created that panel. We worked very hard with all of the organizations and I'm really pleased that yesterday we had our first regional transportation advisory panel meeting. Uh, Mr. Harrell, join me on that. Uh, Mr. Page, who is on um, this call as well, join, join us on that. Um, we had 67 representatives from our community participate in a two and a half hour discussion about opportunities for public transportation for the Hampton Roads region. And we think it was a great start to this effort. Um, I look forward to working with Mr. Harrell and HRT and Mr. Page at HRTAC as we continue um, uh, to advance those conversations and um, as we create advocacy for um, advancing regional transit initiatives in, in, in our region. So wanted to, wanted to mention that. Um, from there, um, we, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would, um, I would recommend um, that we also, uh, if, if I may ask for the privilege under my report, recommend that we have two really important people that we would like to recognize today. Um, one is Mayor John Rowe, who uh, Mr. Ta or Mayor Tuck is, you're well aware, has um, served with great leadership to our HRTPO. So let's start with that one. And Mr. Chairman, I might turn that back over to you for a, a quick introduction. So. Well, and I appreciate that. And I, I often say that sometimes relationships are a lot like a summer camp experience. You get there on a Sunday, you spend uh, maybe the first couple of days trying to 
get your footing and realize why you're there. Maybe on the third day, Wednesday or so, you, you meet that one individual that you uh, get somewhat close to. And so Thursday and Friday is really building that relationship. And then Saturday comes and you got to go home. And um, I feel that way about John. Um, I, you know, we, we've served as co-chairs of the HRT Transformation uh, Committee project. Um, we've served on the Harumpha. We've served on HRTPO. And I think the one time that we really, really bonded was that um, we had the trip to Jefferson Lab. And I just thought that it was a great opportunity for sharing. And I just, you know, I just think that he's just really been a great friend to me and a great supporter. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to miss him. Um, and I think that's what happens when you become a member of this board, that sometimes you, you wind up leaving on your own or your you know, circumstances arise that you have to leave. But um, he's going to be missed. And so I want to pass back to you for is proper due. Yes, sir. Mayor Tuck, thank you so much for those introductory comments. So what we will have, and um, I'm going to ask Kelly Arledge if she wouldn't mind um, just illustrating um, this. We're going to do this virtually, Mayor Rose, so this will be a little different than the way we like to do this. But Kelly, um, if you could please um, um, show everyone via your camera, we do have a resolution of appreciation for Mayor John Rowe. And I'm, I'm not going to read it in excruciating detail, but I do want to touch on a couple things. Um, Mayor Rowe, uh, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, served as chairman of the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization uh, from October 2019 to October uh, 2020. He also served as vice chair before that for two years, from 2017 until 2019. Um, I, I, we, we talk about in our resolution of appreciation just how much he's devoted his time and his energy. Mayor Tuck and others, I think you'd agree, you pick up the phone, Mayor Tuck answers, right? And you, you send him a text, he responds. And, you know, I, I think you're all aware when you're chairing a group uh, like this, there's a lot of prep work that happens. And he's always put in that upfront work to make our meetings successful. Um, during his time with the TPO board, he's been instrumental in several regional initiatives. Obviously, as a member of the TPO and HR TAC, he's worked with all of you side by side as you've all advanced through the HR TAC, the funding of these uh, regional transportation priority projects and prioritized them at, at the TPO, a critical role in that. He played a critical role in forming the Elizabeth River Crossing Task Force. And I think the fruits of a lot of that work are going to be shown later today in terms of how we're unifying as a region around that important issue. Um, and, and also played a really key role working with William over at HRT and all the partners regionally in forming the first Hampton Roads Regional Transit Fund. Um, so Mayor Rowe, um, on behalf of the HRTPO, the staff, the board members, but most importantly, on behalf of our regional community, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And um, um, it, it's just a, been a pleasure and, and an honor. And, and although we can't do the photo op that we all would want to do today, could we all join and maybe, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if it would be appropriate, um, can we all um, agree to accept the resolution by consensus with a hand clap for uh, Mayor Rowe and his service? <laughs> Here, here. Here, here. Best wishes, John. It was an honor serving with you, and it'll be an honor to continue with you as a friend. Congratulations, John. Congratulations, John. It's a pleasure serving with you. Thank you. Don, speech, he, speech, speech. <laughs> Golly, this is a. Uh, this is moving. Uh, you do build uh, not only superficial friendships, uh, friendships, and I count uh, count you, Donnie, as a friend, and and uh, Bobby, and and the other members of the uh, TPO. A um, couple points. One, I'm just so so excited about the region. The story that we often hear that we don't have regional. Uh, cooperation is a story that's not true. Uh, we do. And this is a prime example of uh, the foresightedness of the leaders of the region and how we cooperate. Second, I contend that both the TPO and the PDC 
here in Hampton Roads are the gold standard for the state. If one wants to see how to run a TPO, uh, how to make things happen, just look to the Hampton Roads uh, TPO. And it's been my real honor and pleasure to be a part of this, this group. Um, and I know that uh, the group's gonna continue to do great things. And I'm just humbled uh, by the comments and thank you for the resolution. So Mr. Mayor, we have a, um, uh, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chair Tuck, uh, we, we have a, uh, a beautiful resolution framed um, that we'll, we will be presenting um, with, with our signatures uh, to Mayor Rowe um, just as soon as we can. So thank you, thank you for um, um, giving us the time to present that recognition. Um, but Mr. Chairman, if I may continue, we have one other order of business that I'd like to take care of under um, my, my report as well. For sure. So I think, um, I think everybody's aware, um, and it's come upon us very quickly, that come the end of this year, Mike Kimbrell will be retiring as the Deputy Executive Director of the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization. Um, Mike, it's probably hard to believe you never thought this would get here, but this is your last HRTPO board meeting. <laughs> and who would have ever thought it would happen in this way, right, virtually? But I would like to say just a few words, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, about Mike Kimbrell. Um, I don't know how much all of you, uh, I know many of you have got to know him and you've got to respect him, um, but it, it's amazing. Mike has been with the HRTPO for 31 years. He has spent his entire career with this organization. And a little funny story that Mike Kimbrell once told me, he started here as an intern, Dwight Farmer hired him. And my all-time favorite, my all-time favorite uh, Mike Kimbrell story is that he was um, this young engineer and he was trying to model himself after Dwight Farmer. And you, you all knew Dwight, right? And, and, and Mike told me once, he said, man, I thought Dwight really dressed sharp. You know, he had the nice tie. He always had that killer power suit on. So he went up to Dwight and said, where do you get your clothes and how do you pick your clothes out? And Dwight told him, Mike, you go to J.C. Penney's. And you look at the mannequin and what they got on the mannequin, buy it. He said, you'll never go wrong. So I always, I always really enjoyed Mike uh, tell me that story. But um, what, what, what you need to know about Mike is um, these transportation projects that we're seeing built right now, um, he's been working on for three decades. Um, Mike, um, he's, again, he started as an intern. Um, he's a professional engineer. He's been part of the technical background of this organization, has been our foundation. Uh, Mike supervised the financial planning and programming for many years for the TPO. So all of your RSTP money and CMAC money and the monies that you fiscally constrain in the long range plan, Mike was always an integral part of that. Um, very hardworking guy. Um, I was so excited that we were able to move him into the deputy executive director position in February, 2018. And I'm um, just so pleased that as we sit here and look at wrapping up 2020 and 2021, that he and his wife, Martha, are looking forward to, to retirement. Um, I think a mountain destination might be in the cards. He's still working through all that. Um, but we have um, uh, Mayor, Mayor Tuck similarly designed a resolution for Mike pointing out his accomplishments. And if, if I may uh, suggest, sir, Mr. Chairman, uh, a round of applause for Mr. Kimbrell uh, would indicate consensus to approve that resolution, sir. <laughs> Here you go, Mike. And um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I would love to put Mike on the spot here and um, g give him a chance to address the HRTPO board. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Mr. Chair and members uh, for this wonderful recognition. You know, it's really been a distinct honor to work for this board and the people of Hampton Roads since I started with this organization back in 1989. Uh, I'd like to thank Bob Crum, first of all, for, for having faith in me when he selected me to lead the HRTPO function a few years ago. Uh, it's been the highlight of my career, really, and it's been rewarding working closely with Bob, uh, Kevin Page over at HRTAC, uh, Chris Hall and his great team at VDOT as this region got 
over $5 billion of transportation mega projects underway just in the last few years. It's incredible. Uh, you know, given that I recall backups at the HRBT back when I was attending ODU in the mid 80s, it's especially exciting to see that project started. Uh, I consider this deputy executive uh, director position really to be a plum assignment, not just because of the interesting work we get to do, uh, but because of the great people uh, with whom I've had the pleasure of working at all your localities, uh, but especially the high caliber professionals that make up our HRTPO staff. I really want to give a shout out to our uh, our staff members. It's been amazing to work with such a dedicated and passionate group of people. And I think that's one of the things I'll miss most about leaving this job. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my wife, Martha, and I probably wouldn't hear the end of it if I didn't thank my wife, Martha, but uh, she's been so consistent in her love and support for me uh, throughout the years in my career. And in retirement, I intend to use uh, some of the extra time to support her in endeavors that are especially important to her. Uh, so thanks again for this wonderful gesture and all the hard work that you guys do uh, for the people of Hampton Roads. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. And thank you. And uh, that brings us to agenda, agenda item number four, which is public comments. Um, public comments were invited in advance of the meeting by email or phone. There were no public comments received as of 48 hours before this meeting. Uh, and no submitted public comments were received, uh, and there are no public comments from October. So we're going to move to agenda item number five, which is continuation from the October 15th, 2020 meeting. Um, Mr. Crawl, would you give us an update, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you will recall that last month we kicked off our coordination discussion between the three transit systems with presentations from Mr. Harrell from Hampton Roads Transit and another presentation from uh, the Williamsburg Area Transit Authority to discuss their transit networks and what they saw as opportunities uh, for the future. Um, we, we are really pleased now to have our next transit system come in and provide a similar briefing and have Mr. LJ Hansen uh, from the Suffolk Transit System with us today. So LJ, I see your PowerPoint is up and I'll turn that over to you uh, for, for you to provide your briefing. Thanks for being with us today, LJ. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to offer some continuing comments as it relates to the regional transit network that we are really all trying to envision and, and, and bring to fruition. Uh, last month, you, you did hear from WADA and from HRT and hopefully my comments today will help add in some uh, and, and fill in some holes as to what we're doing in the more rural part, at, at least uh, for Suffolk. So uh, without any, any further ado, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how the city of Suffolk and Suffolk Transit operate. Um, we operate on a little bit different model. Um, all of the facilities are owned by the city of Suffolk. The buses, uh, all of our funding sources and everything actually run through the city of Suffolk, but we contract the service out. So currently our contractor is Vir Virginia Regional Transit, and they operate in a couple of different areas, um, mostly under their own banner. So they're, even their structure with us is a little bit different. Um, at present, we have about six, we have six uh, routes that run, for the most part, full day service. Uh, there are a couple that have some alternate uh, hours, but six days of the week. And when, of course, we offer complimentary paratransit service in, a, in coordination with that. Um, in the past, our service was geared to expand to the largest area that we could. Uh, in 2012, of course, we separated from Hampton Roads Transit. Um, and that was done largely as a result of the efficiency study that was done in 2011. Um, and the model that we operate under is a, is a little bit different than the larger systems. And, and, and it served our needs well uh, up until this point to have these large expansive loops. Um, but as you heard from Mr. Harrell uh, last month, you know, that, that really creates some pressures on people when you have one hour service times. And so we're, we're kind of looking to see how we can modify that, uh, change our service areas from larger loops and, and uh, move it to something that's a little bit more frequent. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the recommendations that we've, that we've come up with. Um, this is just a snapshot from our service app. We have an app that's available um, and it allows actually our, our 
drivers or our passengers rather to see where their bus is and see where they are. But this map is actually a kind of a useful way for you to see where our service area is. We have a number of routes in the downtown Suffolk area. Uh, the, the pink route shown here extends into Chesapeake and makes connections with Hampton Roads Transit. And the purple route in the North Suffolk area also connects with Hampton Roads Transit. But, but by and large, most of our service is, is geared towards the city of Suffolk itself. Thought you might like to have a little bit of information about what type of service we have. Um, we, as I mentioned, we separated in 2012 from Hampton Roads Transit. We kind of made a projection. We only had about six months of service there, but we made a projection. We were moving about 50,000 people that first year. Um, and we've seen steady growth uh, up until the pandemic hit when we we started to see a little bit of a, a fall off. And, and that's to be expected, of course, everybody's seeing a reduction on that side. Um, this year is, is no different. We're still seeing a little bit of a reduction, but by and large, uh, not as not as significant as some of the larger systems, and and that probably stems from the fact that most of our ridership is is not choice ridership. Um, it, these are folks that are pr predominantly dependent upon transit. Uh, thought you also might care to know a little bit about our funding sources. Um, most of our funding at this point still comes from local funds, but that's a it's a it's still while it's the largest share it has uh, been significantly reduced with the introduction of federal assistance which is making up about 33 percent of our funding we do receive state operating and capital assistance as well and we receive a very small share of bus advertisements but by and large the the uh, funding sources are predominantly made up of local federal and state funding um, in 2019, we went to rework our transit development plan, and this is a lot like the state's six-year plan, where we're trying to forecast what our needs are, where our growth is going to be, what type of programs that we would need to have. Um, we had previously done a transit development plan prior to receiving federal assistance, and with us having received, now receiving federal assistance, we felt it was prudent to go back and revise what we were planning uh, based upon that significant change in our funding stream. Um, the General Assembly requested, though, that we uh, change our transit development plan to a more thorough transit strategic plans so that we could be consistent with those plans that were being prepared by HRT and WADA. And again, Mr. Harrell gave a presentation on HRT's transit strategic plan uh, last month, and uh, I believe uh, it wasn't Zach, uh, gave a presentation on WADA and I, they have yet to finish theirs. Um, part, of the, part of the reason for doing this was to allow us to coordinate between the three different uh, transit agencies and try and find those areas where we had overlapping interests or means that we might be able to complete, uh, uh, complement each other's service. So. And we did complete our transit service plan in January of this year. Uh, as part of the, the program or as part of the plan, we've identified some of the priorities that we feel are necessary for Suffolk to continue to grow, um, it, for our services to be able to be meaningful to our riders and to support the economic development that we see in our community. And part of that had to do with with what I alluded to earlier was realigning our routes and and trying to get away from these large loop styles uh, routes where we might have traffic going even if service is only offered once an hour if we have service bi-directional on the same route then at least if somebody gets to their destination and they can get back on the on the same route without having to wait an hour it, it would in in some ways be much more frequent service from that standpoint uh, our writers also said that they'd like to see expanded weekday Saturday service. Um, they'd like to see, you know, uh, obviously, anytime we put out a, a request for information, folks will want to see more service hours, and they'd like to see more frequent service. Um, one of the other things, though, that was particularly interesting that we found was that our writers wanted to hear commuter and on-demand service, and this is predominantly outside of the service areas that we're that we're talking about right now and i will have some maps to show you here in just a second um, so under a, a fully implemented plan uh, of course this is always funding 
determined, uh, we would be looking at much the same service area for the fixed routes. But if you if you can see this clearly, there is a green line that extends into Windsor. Um, one of the things that we heard from the community, and and the community was surveyed as a whole, not just the city of Suffolk, but those that might have interest in our services. Uh, the community of the town of Windsor and the residents there have expressed the ability to be able to get into Suffolk, to be able to get to medical appointments and that type of thing. So the potential exists that that might be a, an extension that we would look at in the future. Um, there are some areas that are hash marked out. Those are areas that are identified for possible um, on-demand service where the population density isn't significant enough to uh, warrant having regular service, but perhaps having on-demand service would allow us to build up a ridership level that, that ultimately could uh, foster more frequent service. And we think we have some solutions as to how we might be able to do this. One item that's not pictured on the map is that we have applied for a smart scale grant to establish service between the Victory uh, Plaza in Portsmouth and downtown Suffolk. Uh, specifically on the on the uh, west side of downtown where our uh, industrial center is. Um, we've heard from a number of our uh, larger businesses that workforce development is is essential to them. And, and so that was a, an avenue that we decided that we would pursue through our smart scale application. Um, as I mentioned in the TDP, there were a number of identified opportunities to connect to uh, both the Hampton Roads transit uh, area and to the Western communities. And, and so uh, we, we're very anxious to work with HRT, with WADA, to develop opportunities to just create that network that makes, that makes it uh, transit seamless for the rider. Um, and, and we've already identified some possible uh, ways that we might be able to do that. We've talked about ways to uh, develop complementary fare payment, um, intelligent transportation solutions. As I mentioned earlier, we have one already in place. It's uh, Google based. So if even if we weren't using the exact same system as HRT, because it's Google based, uh, we, we feel that it would be possible that we could all develop a format where we might be able to complement one another and perhaps uh, make it so that we could see each other inside of our own apps. And that's, that's the kind of coordination, I think, that's going to be important to us. And of course, anything that we can do to strengthen ties between the different agencies is, is only going to benefit the entire region. And with that, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have or um, anything else that I can help with. Are there any questions from the uh, members of the HRTPO? Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Yes. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hansen, can I uh, see that slide one more time uh, of your services going into Suffolk? I apologize. I, I wasn't aware that there were, but I I, mean, I knew we had some. I'm just, just not sure where that was. Or you can just Chesapeake. tell. Chesapeake. I mean, going there actually, we actually have uh, services. That, there are services. So Suffolk Transit extends into uh, the Chesapeake service area and, and stops at Chesapeake Square Mall. And then we have one area in the northern part of Suffolk where Hampton Roads Transit does extend to our joint uh, operations facility in North Suffolk. And so there's a, another transfer point at that location. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Ma Mayor Tuck, um, if I may. Um, LJ, thank you so much for, for the overview. Um, really want to compliment you on your collaboration with Portsmouth and wonder if you could just take a minute to maybe expand on that a little bit in terms of that joint, that, that service that, that you're thinking about there. Right. Um, the the uh, industrial center to the west of downtown Suffolk, uh, we have a large number of warehouses and that type of thing. I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. As we reached out and, and talked to our partners in business, one of the essential elements is always job force. And, um, you know, we recognize that there's job force 
located in the city of Suffolk, but there's also a job force that's located outside of the city of Suffolk. And we have this large geographic barrier, the, the dismal swamp that, that really cuts us off from easy transit communication, uh, transportation. And so uh, we felt that it would be appropriate to establish some type of, a, of an express uh, system that would allow folks to be able to get from the, uh, uh, an HRT hub, which the, lo the closest one to us would be that Victory Crossing hub, um, directly to our job employment center um, that, is, that is located in that area. I know that HRT is also working uh, with us and with some of our other industrial partners in the northern part of the city as we talk about Amazon, the two Amazon facilities. And so we're, we're looking to see how we can make connections for those areas as well. But we felt it was incumbent upon the city of Suffolk uh, and through Suffolk Transit to try and explore some type of, of an express service route to get folks right into the heart of, the, of our industrial area. And that's, that's something that was established at one point when we used to have a max route. Um, and the, that, was, that was done on a trial program. And, and when that grant went away, uh, we, we kind of lost that ability. Uh, we think that it's an important enough route that we need to go back and try and reestablish that. Any other questions or comments? Thank you again. It brings us to item number six, the approval of consent items. Mr. Cronin. Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So our consent agenda today uh, involves our minutes from our last HRTPO board meeting on October the 15th. Um, our HRTPO financial statement, uh, we have a, an amendment to our unified planning work program. Uh, we'll be asking you to accept the final report on the impact of trails and sidewalks on home values. Um, and we do have a couple of uh, TIP amendments. Um, in the city of Norfolk, uh, we have TIP amendments for the Norfolk signal system improvements and the Norfolk bus shelter and pedestrian improvements. Uh, we have a statewide TIP amendment for the Route 460 uh, PPTA debt service. Uh, in the city of Suffolk, we have a TIP amendment to transfer CMAP funding uh, for the Nansman Parkway traffic signal upgrades. And then finally for WADA, we have uh, 13 different projects for WADA that are outlining your agenda uh, where they need uh, TIP amendments to allow them to uh, advance their money and, and advance those projects. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would recommend that the TPO board consider action uh, to approve today's consent agenda. I ask for a motion and a second, and please remember to give your name as you make the motion and second. Rick West, I moved. Tom Shepard, uh, second. Any questions or discussions? Mr. Cohen, would you call for the vote? Yes, upon a motion uh, by Mr. We Mayor West and second by Mr. Shepard, uh, approval of the consent agenda. Mayor West? Aye. Mayor Rabel? Aye. Mr. Bazzani? Aye. Mayor Tuck? Aye. Mr. McCarty? Mr. Hippel? Aye. Mr. Jenkins. Aye. Mayor Alexander. Yes. Mr. Green. Aye. Mayor Rowe. Aye. Mr. Gillette. Mayor Johnson. Mayor Dyer. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. Mr. Harrell. Aye. Mr. Trogdon. Aye. Mr. Hall. Yes. Ms. DeBrule. Yes. Ms. Vick. Yes. Senator Locke. Senator Sproul. Delegate Heretic. Delegate Ward. Aye. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Mahaley, does our motion carry? Motion is carried. Thank you so much, sir. That brings us to item number seven. Thank you. Um, Mayor Tuck, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, with your permission, I will introduce this item and then maybe look to um, yourself and Mayor Rowe to add additional uh, comments. 
um, re related to the item. Uh, the, uh, the topic for today's meeting is the consideration by this board, the HRTPO board, of a regional proclamation that would allow our region to stand united um, in expressing our goals and our guiding principles for working together with the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, to address the serious impact that the tolls that we are experiencing at the downtown and midtown tunnels are having on the residents of the Hampton Roads region. Um, and, and if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to provide a couple of background comments. I think everybody's aware of much of this, but I, I just want to view, review some background very quickly. So the agreement for the construction of the downtown and midtown tunnels was signed by the Commonwealth of Virginia back in 2011. Uh, and it was signed with two private entities. One entity, one entity named Skanska USA and the other entity named Macquarie. The agreement that was signed by the Commonwealth and these two private entities provided for the construction of the downtown and midtown tunnels. And it also provided for the construction of the Martin Luther King extension to 264. The total cost of those projects was about uh, two point one six billion with a B dollars. And obviously the, the challenge at that time was that the Commonwealth just did not have the money to be able to build those assets. So a couple of things to stress. That agreement is signed between the Commonwealth of Virginia and Skanska and Macquarie. The region is not signatory to the contract, nor are any of the individual localities. So that's that's very, very important to remember uh, in, in, in terms of um, our, our, our positioning on this. The agreement, I think you're all aware, reached out many years to 2070. Um, it allowed tolls to increase um, three and a half percent annually. And, and even included a provision that if the consumer price index or CPI was higher than that, that the possibility of tolls with increasing higher was also uh, left open as a possibility. Um, before I leave tolls, the other item that I think has impacted our region significantly is several years ago, there was a lot of frustration in our community, as you're aware, about administrative procedures. And those administrative procedures, unfortunately, were very difficult for many men members of our community, particularly those low income residents that if you didn't have an easy pass or perhaps didn't have a bank account, um, Many times what we were seeing was our residents would become uh, late with penalties on, on going through the toll, uh, the, the tunnels and the tolls. Um, those penalties would add up and what, because people didn't have an easy pass or a bank account to, to pay the toll through the easy pass system, suddenly they were ending up with large, large sums of penalties. Um, now, we, we want to credit um, uh, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, as you're aware, Governor McAuliffe was very engaged in that. Um, they brought in um, management to really clean up those administrative fees. And I think um, credit is due for all that work was done to address uh, some of those challenges. But the issue keeps occurring. And the issue being that these tolls um, are incredibly impactful in, uh, not only on the city of Portsmouth and the city of Norfolk, but we're finding on businesses and residents from throughout uh, the Hampton Roads region. The other item in that agreement between the Commonwealth and the two private entities was to define certain transportation projects in Hampton Roads as potential competing facilities that could if there was documentation to prove that they move traffic away from the ERC assets could require the Commonwealth of Virginia to pay a compensation event. And what's very concerning is some of those facilities are the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel and some of those facilities are the high rise bridge. 
um, your regional priority projects. So that has always been a, a big concern uh, to, to our community and our region. Because of these concerns under the leadership of Mayor John Rowe, the, who was then the sitting chair of the HRTPO, Mayor Donnie Tuck um, was um, very much um, involved with stressing uh, these concerns. Mayor, uh, Mayor Alexander from the city of Norfolk, um, tremendous leadership in this area. But you all approached the HRTPO about setting up a task force of the TPO. That task force was formed. It was chaired by Mayor Rowe and Mayor Alexander. Um, and I really want to credit that task force for opening up lines of communication with the current administration. Um, they held um, a couple of meetings pre-COVID. Um, those mayors and others traveled with us up to Richmond where we held meetings with the Secretary of Transportation, where we held meetings with um, Attorney General office staff, the Deputy Secretaries of Transportation, et cetera. Um, before I go any further, there, I would like to pause. And, and again, it's important to give credit where credit is due here. Um, and I see Delegate Heretic is on. And Delegate Heretic is a member of the ERC Task Force. I want to thank you for, for your leadership in this regard. Morning, and thank you. Yes, and, and Mayor Linda Johnson um, has been engaged in these conversations as well as all of our task force members that even include Mr. Shepard from the peninsula and, 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 and other members. Um, I really want to credit the current administration at the state level for their openness and their willingness to sit at the table and try to communicate and coordinate on what might be possible opportunities to make the situation better. Um, and, and, and that thanks needs to go out to um, Secretary Shannon Valentine, Deputy Secretary uh, Nick Donahue, um, Deputy Secretary John Lawson, uh, C Commissioner Stephen Britch. Um, this is a very, very difficult issue. Very difficult issue. But they have come to Hampton Roads to meet with us. They have kept lines of communication open. And we're talking about the art of what's possible. And I, I can't thank them not enough for their responsiveness and for their collaborative work and relationship on this. So as we work through this item as best we could through the COVID situation um, with the leadership of the ERC task force, it became aware uh, to us that this ERC asset was going to sell. And you saw the announcement just a couple weeks ago that, that in fact, um, there is a buyer. Um, it's my understanding and um, our CT, one of our CT members, uh, Shep Miller is on the ERC task force and he may have more info on this, but. My understanding is that the, um, the, the, the state, the Commonwealth will be required to approve the cell, but the cell is proposed to um, a Spanish toll company named Albertus. Um, Albertus, again, is a Spanish toll company. This will be their first toll road in the United States, um, but they do operate 5,000 miles of toll roads in 16 different countries. So they're a group with a lot of experience in this area. Their partner in the purchase was Manulife Investment Management, but Manulife bought it for, on, the, on behalf of John Hancock Life Insurance Company. So those are our two new owners. And with um, the, the amount of money that went to Skanska and Macquarie and the amount of money the new buyers assumed in debt, the, the assets sold for about $2.3 billion. Kevin Page is on the line. He has worked hard. We've looked at everything that we can do to say, would there have been a possibility for the region to purchase it? And unfortunately, we just weren't in a position financially with, with over $5.3 billion out there for construction to be a buyer at this particular point in time. But with everything that's happening, um, I've been in conversations with Mayor Rowe, I've been in conversations with Mayor Tuck, and what we've brought to you today is a proposed proclamation. That proclamation is included in your agenda. Um, I would like to ask if, um, well, let, let, let me pause a second and say that I hope everybody had a chance to read that proclamation. What this is intended to be is a statement a statement that is in, adopted by the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission, and later today by the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. 
saying that as three regional organizations, we represent 17 local governments and over 1.7 million people, and we stand united in um, expressing um, our interest to continue to work with the Commonwealth of Virginia and the new owners on solutions to this challenge. Some of the guiding principles we can talk about a little more, but the one first guiding principle is that we really want to request toll mitigation or relief for our residents. Uh, that we feel that uh, we need to take permanent steps to reduce tolls and the escalation of toll rates for our residents and businesses. Secondly, we really believe that we need to reduce the regional impact of compensation events. Keep in mind, HRBT and High Rise Bridge are mentioned as competing facilities, and we want to see the decisions that lead to the advancement of our regional priority projects not be compromised by this agreement. Thirdly, we think that uh, we need a regionally integrated network. You have worked with HR TAC. HR TAC is going to fund a uh, regional uh, express lanes network that goes across uh, around our beltway. We just don't think an isolated entity in the center of the donut operating that toll network in a way that's not plugged into those regional express lanes makes sense. And we believe that um, the best approach, what we've heard the ERC task force members say is the best approach is to explore means and methods to move the downtown and midtown tunnels into a publicly owned and managed regional network. And then finally, we, we can't thank the current administration enough. We really would like to see the Commonwealth commit that we can work with future administrations at the state level to continue working uh, on this critically important issue. So. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Mahaley, for include, putting the resolution there. Um, Mayor Tuck, I would like to forward it back to you as chair and ask if you um, had any comments in addition to what I've said. Um, and then when you're complete, I believe Mayor Rowe would like to say uh, a few words on behalf of the ERC uh, task force. Well, I think that your comments were very, very complete, uh, giving us a background and even the current status of this. Let me say this, that um, I think it was sometime last year that there was a, an op-ed in the Virginian pilot that talked about the impact of the um, tolls on the midtown and the downtown tunnels and uh, the impact on the residents of Portsmouth in particular. And in that editorial, it stated for the most part that we as a region had let down the city of Portsmouth but not rallying around them to try and advocate on their behalf with the General Assembly. And I'm not sure how much clout we have, but uh, as a result of that, the ERC task force was formed out of that. And so I think we've made a great, great progress. Uh, so I think this resolution takes that a bit further, but I will now yield to Mayor Rowe. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Donnie. And I think both of you have made, you being uh, Donnie and Bob, have made an excellent summary of what's transpired over the last couple of years. And um, I think we really got the attention uh, of the administration, um, especially too with Delegate Heretic's uh, budget amendment that put the narrative in there that uh, in the budget bill that the the governor through the secretary of transportation would study this matter. Um, I am so proud of the region that we came together on a unanimous uh, vote that this is a, a problem for the entire region, that we really cannot have a truly integrated uh, transportation network as long as we have uh, this uh, as the center, uh, kind of the hole in the donut. And so I'm hopeful that day we will again uh, vote unanimously to authorize uh, you, uh, Mr. Chair, to sign the proclamation. Um, it's Terry Danaher from the Citizens or the Community Advisory Committee. Um, this was, Robert did a, an excellent presentation to our committee at our meeting last week. And this was of enormous interest to our group. Um, everybody is now recognizing the impact. There have been so many impact statements made by, you know, the state of the, the region uh, every year has included something about the impact of this on, on all the localities, but especially Portsmouth. Um, 
when we last met as a task force, some problems were identified and the Secretary of State's staff were gonna talk, you know, go and do some research on those. And since the, the um, Commonwealth has to approve this contract, if they can look at the problems that we discussed and that have been identified by uh, people who live here and say, we need these things mitigated in order to approve this contract because part of it, part of approving the contract has to do with their, the company's ability to actually carry out their duties properly. So if, if that could be something that is emphasized, um, we would appreciate it and, and being kept in the loop the way uh, Bob Crum has, has done. Thank you. Uh, Mr. 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 Can you do this, please? Can you one moment? I, I'm wondering if it's appropriate, first of all, to ask for a motion and a second, then we have discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, John Rowe, I move for approval. And uh, with that motion, uh, given the uh, chair the authority to sign the proclamation. Bobby Dyer, second. Okay, now we have discussion. Mr. Bazzani? Yes, sir. I was just wondering if um, the General Assembly included Gloucester County as part of the toll studies as in, in addition to this proclamation, because for Gloucester County, the, the tolls on the bridge is an economic uh, hindrance to our growth. And well over 70% of the residents pay this toll to go back and forth into Hampton Roads from Gloucester. I was wondering if the General Assembly considered that as well. Anyone want to answer on that one? I'm, I'm not making any demands. I'm just asking because one of our one of our legislative agenda items will will be you know the, the, the topic of tolls on the Coleman Bridge because our our original bonds expire in 2021 and that included operations and maintenance and those are entirely different issues to discuss here. But I'm just wondering if the General Assembly did in fact talk about tolls on the Coleman Bridge in the Middle Peninsula. So that that that's it. I'll just uh, just leave it at that. <laughs> Anyone want to offer perspective on that, Mr. Crum or Mr. Page? Um, Mr. Chair, when we created the uh, Elizabeth River uh, Crossing Task Force, um, the focus was on those two tunnels because of the non-compete clause and the impact that uh, tolling was having on the whole region. Um, we understand that the port uh, represents 10% of the state economy and if you want to get goods and services to the western part of the state, most likely one of those boxes has to go through the uh, tunnel. Um, I think that we could expand this um, in our discussions with the General Assembly uh, for 2021. And I know that um, we would have a sympathetic, well, I'm speaking for Steve, but Steve Heretic, I'm sure, would be sympathetic to expanding uh, the focus of this to include the Coleman Bridge. Any other thoughts, comments, discussion? Thank you. Hearing none, then I wanna ask Mr. Crum to do roll call vote. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have a motion. Um, made by Mayor Rowe from the city of Portsmouth, seconded by uh, Mayor Dyer from the city of Virginia Beach for the HRTPO to take action to approve a proclamation of the Hampton Roads region, supporting efforts to mitigate the impact of the downtown and midtown tunnel tolls on our region's residents. I will now call the roll. Uh, Mayor West. Yes. Mayor Raybill. Yes. Mr. Bazzani. Yes. Mayor Tuft. Aye. Mr. McCarty. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. Jenkins. Aye. Mayor Alexander. Yes. Mr. Green. Aye. Mayor Rowe. Uh, Mayor Rowe. Aye. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Gillette. Mayor Johnson. 
Mayor Dyer. Yes. Mayor Pons. Yes. Mr. Shepard. Aye. Mr. Harrell. Yes. Mr. Trogdon. Yes. Mr. Hall. Abstain. Ms. DeBrule. Abstain. Ms. Vick. Yes. Senator Locke. Senator Sproul. Delegate Heretic. Aye. Delegate Ward. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mahaley, does our motion carry? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our motion carries. I'll, I'll send it back over to you, sir. Great. Thank you. That brings us to item number eight. Yes. Uh, we have today what we think is a very timely and informative presentation on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel and Parallel Thimble Shoal Tunnel uh, project update. Uh, we have, um, uh, we, we had planned to have Mr. Jeffrey Holland with us today, but what we have is um, we do have the Deputy Executive Director, Mr. Michael Christ, who I know is very knowledgeable about this project. So, uh, Mr. Christ, I then want to thank you so much for being with us today. Um, our staff can turn over to you the ability to share your screen. Uh, I know you have a PowerPoint, and uh, we look forward to your presentation and overview, sir. Mr. Chris, uh, oh, thank you. There we go. <laughs> Mr. Chris, just want to check on your um, on on your on your microphone there. If we could do a quick sound check. Could I ask, um, could I staff maybe to stop over and let me know if they can confirm that um, Mr. Chris. Mr. Is, uh, oh, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. There we go. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. I knew you were there. <laughs> Thank you so uh, much. Trying to get the right mute. Thank you. Trying to get the right mute button, right? So, uh, okay. We're can you see my screen now? Yeah, you can go ahead and start your slideshow, and I believe everybody will. Yep, perfect. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Think you're good to go. Thank you. Sorry for the uh, little technical glitch there. Uh, That's still okay. working out a few uh, few of those bugs, but uh, uh, thank you for the for the opportunity this morning. As as you mentioned, uh, Jeff Holland was uh, planning to be with you all this morning, but has been otherwise tied up uh, this morning. So I would like to uh, provide a little update on the Parallel Thimble Shoal Tunnel project, and uh, want to acknowledge and and thank the, uh, the TPO for including us in the uh, transportation improvement program. Uh, last month. Uh, so <clears throat> one of the things I want to point out, uh, certainly everybody knows where the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel uh, facility is. Uh, and while I'm going to talk primarily an update on the Thimble Shoal Tunnel project, uh, I did want to point out the Chesapeake Channel project uh, and, and say a couple words about that, uh, because we've got some early planning going on there and want to make the, uh, the TPO aware of that. Uh, and this map, I, I really wanted to highlight uh, not only the location of the Thimble Shoal Channel uh, and the tunnel project, but make the, uh, the TPO and the members here aware that we have been and continue to work with the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the Virginia Port Authority on the deepening project uh, to deepen the, uh, the Norfolk Harbor channels, uh, which extends uh, basically from the ocean uh, marker all the way down to, uh, to Sewell's Point and uh, eventually Penner's Point. So the, uh, the channel over the top of the, uh, the tunnel will be deepened in the future. The Army Corps has already begun the project of deepening the, the channels on either side of us, and we continue to work with the Port Authority on, on deepening over the existing tunnel. Uh, so the existing Thimble Shoal Tunnel, when it was installed in the 60s, uh, was, was designed to accommodate up to a 55-foot deep channel, uh, which is what we're working on now with the, uh, with the Port and the Corps. And that will be accomplished in the in the next few years. Uh, and that is a segue to the to the new tunnel project. 
Uh, and what we have here on the left side of the screen is, is an aerial picture of one island uh, at the bottom of the picture, what we call two island, top of the photo. You see the existing Thimble Shoal Tunnel uh, between the two. That was an immersed tube tunnel, as I mentioned, installed in the, in the 60s, opened in 1964. <clears throat> in the 1990s, completed in 1999, we paralleled the, uh, the bridges across the facility. And at the time, if you look at the very bottom of the photo, you'll see where the, uh, the bridges were set up and, and it's kind of set to, uh, to extend the future tunnel which would run parallel to the existing. Uh, that was done over 20 years ago in some advanced planning that would have required the, uh, the doubling of the size of the islands. Uh, so when we looked at uh, installing the new tunnel through the design build process and some innovations brought forward by contractors, we moved again, of course, to the tunnel boring machine option, which allowed the contractors to completely eliminate any island expansion and the tunnel boring machine will basically start right next to the existing open approach to the to the existing tunnels. Uh, they put a little bit of a bend in the tunnel, as you see there. Uh, so as they tunnel from one island to the next, they'll move away from the existing immersed tube tunnel uh, simply to make sure they don't have any uh, adverse impacts on the existing immersed tube tunnel. So that and that shows you kind of where the uh, the tunnel will be installed uh, once that tunnel is completed in approximately four years. Uh, the new tunnel will, will carry two lanes of traffic southbound, and the existing Thimble Shoal Tunnel will be converted to carry two lanes northbound. Of course, today it's a bi-directional with one lane in each direction, uh, which leads to the safety concerns and delays for maintenance from traffic uh, that we're working to eliminate. So that's uh, generally where the project is. Uh, the next slide that I have here shows uh, a cross-section at the bottom, if you will, of the tunnel from one island to the next. And, and highlighted in the plan view is the navigation channel. I mentioned we are working with the Army Corps and the Port Authority to deepen the existing channel over the existing tunnel and will accommodate that 55-foot channel in the near future. When we, when we set up and designed the new tunnel, it could actually accommodate up to a 70-foot deep channel sometime far off into the future. Uh, we did that because there's very little cost at this time to go ahead and deepen that channel in anticipation that if in the future the existing Thimble Shoal tunnel is ever replaced, it could be replaced at a deeper depth, uh, thereby opening up the, uh, the channel even further. Uh, but for the next uh, 40 or 50 years, we'll be confined to the 55-foot to the deep channel. You see there at the bottom that the tunnel is a little over 6,000 feet long. Uh, from portal to portal, about 6,500 feet. Uh, just as a data point or point of interest, Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel is a little over 7,000 feet long, I believe. Uh, of course, they're doing two tunnel bores uh, at HRBT. And the project uh, cost is $756 million for the, uh, for the tunnel. We're using a, a tunnel boring machine. You see a picture here on the right side. The tunnel boring machine was fabricated in Germany. Uh, we've already gone through the commissioning, so the, the TBM is complete, uh, waiting to be shipped over here uh, middle to, uh, to late next year to start the, the actual tunnel drive. It's uh, 43 feet diameter on the outside, uh, and that will give us a, a two-lane tunnel uh, that, that drives to a depth of about 134 feet below uh, mean low water. <clears throat> Much deeper uh, to allow for the proper cover over the top of the tunnel and to uh, give us a little factor of safety for that future deepening. The, uh, the tunnel construction is being completed by a joint venture of Dragados and Shaboni Construction. Uh, most of you, I think, are aware Dragados is also on the joint venture for the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. And their engineer of record is Mott McDonald, who's also working on the, uh, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel project. And the, the photo I have here is a recent construction photo uh, taken in October. Uh, and what I want to highlight is the, uh, the excavators there in the, uh, in the hole. Uh, they're actually working on the um, open approach structure for the new tunnel. They'll continue excavating <clears throat> to the top of the picture to the north about another uh, 400, 500 feet. 
where they'll complete the launching pit for the tunnel boring machine. <clears throat> so you can see how close that roadway is to the existing. We actually had to demolish the retaining wall uh, that's adjacent to the existing roadway. They've installed sheet pile in there to, uh, to separate the two roadways, uh, but that's literally they'll be separated by a wall. So that's how close it is at that point where the tunnel boring machine will launch. There'll be about uh, 30 feet uh, from the TBM to the existing roadway. And then when it exits the island, it'll be about 50 feet away from the existing immersed tube tunnel and stretch to about 200 feet in separation when it gets to the midpoint of the, uh, the tunnel drive. <clears throat> but you'll notice uh, further to the north there, there's been a structure built on the uh, west side or to the left of the picture. That platform is a temporary dock where they'll offload the tunnel boring machine next summer and place it in the uh, launching pit to begin the tunneling operation. That uh, dock is also set up if the contractor chooses to remove the, the tunnel spoils by barge, they can barge it out and they could also potentially barge in the tunnel segments uh, for the project. But you'll notice looking at that picture, there's not much room uh, left on the islands. It's uh, all filled up by construction and our islands are slightly smaller than what, what they have over at HRBT. So uh, space has been at a premium and creates quite a challenge for our contractor on the, on the working. And, but that's, uh, as I said, about a, about a couple weeks ago, end of October, photograph of the construction on one island. If we continue to the north end of the island, looking across at two island in the very top of the picture here, uh, this kind of highlights where the tunnel will, will cross from one island to the next. So on the lower right side of the picture, you can see a pile of rocks. Uh, those rocks uh, we call armor stone protect the existing immersed tube tunnel from waves and hurricane action. On the left side of the picture is a, a temporary pier structure. This was taken right after they completed building the pier. The contractor will use that as a temporary platform to build a berm in between the pier and our existing rock pile on the right side of the picture. Now, once that berm is completed, they'll then drive the tunnel buoy machine in between the existing immersed tube tunnel on the right and the pier on the left. So that uh, slot, if you will, it's uh, open water now, will eventually be filled in with an engineered fill and uh, covered by rock to protect it from wave action. And that's where the tunnel boring machine will exit the island and head toward the top of the picture to the two island side. And at the uh, top of the picture, the two island side will basically have the same exact operation we're performing at one island, uh, but in reverse. So that's a current state of, of where the project stands on, on one island. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is the tunnel segments. So uh, one of the neat features of a tunnel boring project versus an immersed tube tunnel is the tunnel boring machine builds the tunnel as it progresses from one side to the other. They, they do that through precast tunnel segments. And in our case, we need 9,900 tunnel segments to build the 6,500 uh, foot long tunnel. The contractor uh, subcontracted to a company that set up a plant down in Chesapeake at what was the old Bayshore plant uh, on the southern branch of the Elizabeth River. And they constructed a specially built plant. And if you look at the, uh, the photograph in the upper left, you can see it's basically an assembly line. They had 30 molds to make the, uh, the rings, uh, basically 10 segments per, per ring. So they provided three complete rings and the molds to produce those. And at the uh, best production rate, they were making one segment approximately every 15 minutes uh, at that plant. And so they rolled those along the assembly line, sent those segments through a steam cure plant, and within four hours of placing concrete, they were stripping forms. And that's uh, what you see in the middle top photograph is a completed segment coming out of the form and being moved into the storage. The, uh, the picture in the upper right is another uh, innovation used on this project, uh, one of the first roadway projects completed in the US. We, we have tunnel segments that are made with steel fiber reinforced concrete. So there's not conventional reinforcing in the tunnel segments. You don't see the conventional rebar in there. Uh, almost looks like little fuzzy hairs that's actually the steel fiber that reinforces the tunnel segment. 
Uh, this one was broken so they could count the segment, uh, fiber pieces in the segment, and confirm the, uh, the dispersion of those fibers. And the bottom photograph shows the storage yard. As I mentioned, there's 9,900 segments for the, for the project. They'll actually complete the last of those segments uh, this week. So they've, they've, over the last year, have, have fabricated all of the tunnel segments we need uh, for the project. So that work has gone very well. And uh, very impressively, out of the 9,000 segments, they only had to reject 20 total segments. So the quality control and the quality assurance process through that factory was, was exemplary and uh, was a real credit to the manufacturer there. So, and that's kind of a quick update on where we are on Thimble Shoal. Uh, I wanted to mention the parallel Chesapeake Tunnel Project uh, just north of Thimble Shoal. Uh, and we have started the preliminary engineering and preliminary planning uh, so that we can move to this project. <clears throat> the Thimble Shoal project is completely funded uh, by our toll facility. Uh, we've certainly sold bonds and we have a TIFIA loan to, to finance that. Through that financial planning, we originally expected the Chesapeake Tunnel would not be completed until the late 2030s or, or maybe even 2040 due to the financial capability of the, the bridge tunnel. Based on current interest rates, uh, we've had our finance uh, consultant do some additional modeling, and we believe we can accelerate that project and currently are looking to refinance our TIFIA loan uh, on the existing tunnel project, which we think will save us on the order of 50 to $100 million in financing for the tunnel project, which will allow us to complete Chesapeake earlier. So we think we can move the Chesapeake Tunnel project up and possibly start that in the 2024 to 2029 timeframe. So what I'm showing here is a, a representative graphic of what that would look like, almost a mirror image of what we're doing at the Thimble Shoal Tunnel project, where we would start on the existing islands, build a launching pit with a tunnel boring machine drive from one island to the next, uh, and again, complete a drive under the Chesapeake Channel that would allow for future deepenings there as well. I mentioned we've started the preliminary planning. We've actually executed the uh, the NEPA work. We're working with Federal Highway to complete the, the NEPA process. Back in September, we completed some initial geotechnical investigations that uh, will confirm our, our soil conditions for tunneling. And we've already started on the preliminary technical requirements to define the, uh, the tunnel itself. And as I mentioned, we are working through a financing plan with our financial consultants to, uh, to, to make sure that we can manage this project uh, in the 2024 to 2029 timeframe. Uh, so that would be a huge benefit for us to complete the paralleling of the entire facility, uh, two lanes in each direction all the way across. Uh, so that project we are currently working to get that into the statewide transportation improvement program. Um, we've got that request into VDOT now uh, so we can advance that project uh, throughout the, the system. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, completes my presentation. I'd be happy to entertain any questions uh, if, if there are some from the group. Well, we wanna thank you for that presentation and ask if any questions or comments or discussion on the presentation. Hearing none, we're going to move on to item number nine. I'm sorry, Mr. Crone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, if I may, I apologize. I wanted to let the TPO board go first. But um, Mr. Chris, um, can, you, um, can you, first off, thank you so much for that overview and presentation. Um, so can you clarify, because I know we're, we're getting, a lot of people get questions. Um, and, and you touched on it, but just to clarify that the current project under construction, the time frame for completion, could you talk about that uh, just high level, please? Certainly. So you probably have seen some of the press that things are a little behind schedule. Um, when I showed the, the photograph of where the tunnel boy machine will drive 
uh, basically between the immersed tube tunnel and the temporary pier that they've constructed. The, uh, the contractor has run into some rocks uh, in that area that they believe is a changed geotechnical condition. We're working through that with the contractor now uh, for a design solution. Uh, that, that's going to take us a few months to, uh, to resolve that and make sure we've got an appropriate uh, technical solution there. Um, that has put the project behind schedule. The uh, contractor early on had some uh, permitting delays that put them behind schedule. And then they had a, a subcontractor that they had to terminate that also put them behind schedule. So uh, originally we, we had planned to have this project completed in 2022. Uh, right now we're forecasting 2024 uh, due to those delays on the permit, the, uh, the bad subcontractor and the, and the rocks that they've encountered uh, in the bay bottom that they need to drive through. So uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there in the media and uh, the grapevine, if you will, uh, but the contractor continues to work with us uh, to figure out design solutions and, and work through those issues that they've encountered. So you know, not unusual on big projects to, uh, to have schedule challenges. Uh, the good thing is we continue to, uh, to move the project forward. And as you can see through the, the pictures, uh, they continue to, to execute uh, what they can on the islands. And uh, we expect to see the tunnel boring machine uh, arrive next summer and then uh, continue on. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for um, for your patience with me. I thought that might be important information. Um, I appreciate that clarification. No, and that was fine. Um, and that brings us to agenda item number nine, which is the uh, three month tentative schedule. Yes, sir. So um, our next HRTPO board meeting will be in January. Um, per our regional meeting schedule in December, the meetings will happen of HR TAC and Harumpha. Um, so our next meeting uh, will, will happen in January. So um, this will officially, uh, Mr. Chairman, be our last TPO board meeting of 2020. With a lot of sadness, but anyway. I, I said oh. I never saw so many. I, I don't know if all the smiles are because we're not having a TPO board meeting again or if because 2020 is coming near an end. <laughs> Andy, babe, is that what that's? I, I saw you <laughs> Well, a, lot of, up. <laughs> a lot of folks came visible on that one. They turned off of the uh, turned on the video cameras. Anyway, <laughs> now item number ten, big minutes. Yes, we have included for your information, board members, the minutes of our HRTPO advisory committee meetings. I'd be happy to respond to any questions there. Item number eleven. That's just uh, some information for your information. It's the um, HR TAC Program Development Monthly uh, Executive Report. Um, we have VDOT and, um, of course, Kevin Page on, on the line if there were any questions ab about that information. And then we also have our HRTPO uh, Transportation Improvement Program quarterly snapshots. No, no action required there, sir. Okay. And uh, brings <laughs> item number 12 old and new business. Any old business or any new business anyone wants to bring up? Mr. Chairman? Yes. This is Shep Miller. If I may, I'm just two quick points, um, not to belabor the uh, discussion about the, the Midtown, the ERC tunnels. You know, back in 2013, I was a member of the transportation board um, as I am now, and it was grateful. I was grateful to see the Commonwealth do what they did with a lot of um, a lot of support and encouragement by the region. And back then we passed a, or the, the legislature passed a 0.7 cent increase in our sales tax. And I will tell you that my experience, and I think it was everyone's experience, is that nobody blinked. The citizens were good with it. Um, I even had lots of conversations with the, with the, tax, um, the tax type people, the Taxpayers Alliance, type folks, and they were good with it as long as it was locked up. And it's been a great funding source, and it's brought us to where we are today. I just merely point that out because if you think about it, if we'd done a penny instead of 0.7 cents, we could have bought this tunnel system. We could have bought the MLK system. We could have done all that. And I tell you, no one would have blinked. So now we're, we're, we're going around our elbow to try to get there. We're fighting this whole issue with compensation events on the new HRBT, 
It's driving all sorts of tolling decisions. And as most of you all know that have been around me very long, I'm not a big fan of tolling as a way to finance because it's regressive to people that can't, that don't have as much money. It's inefficient. And that's what Macquarie told me. Inefficient in the sense of um, there's about 25% that never hits the road, um, et cetera, et cetera. But we are where we are. But my point is another 3.3 cents and we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We could have probably rolled in the, the Coleman Bridge as well. All you need to do is to look at the impact that's happened in Portsmouth and Norfolk and the impact of the Eastern Shore. And maybe we want to keep that rural, but imagine if there was no toll on that bridge tunnel, what would have happened in terms of economic development there? And maybe that's not what we want. Maybe that's not what the shore wants. My point is these are barriers. And so I, I'm encouraged by the proclamation. I'm encouraged by what you all have done. I encourage you to continue to push and find ways to do that. That's number one. And just quickly, number two, even with the design of the new bridge tunnel, the HRBT, which is great, we still have a major problem that is designed in with overheight trucks being able to get through that new expanded tunnel going westbound. The design is for the um, free lanes to be the existing lanes, which are height challenged for trucks. We turn around thousands of trucks every year. And it's not just turning them around, it's all the disruption that happens with that. The current design for lots of reasons, including money, does not do anything to, to ameliorate that. We will continue to have that same problem. We'll continue to fight that situation. And I know a bunch of us, including Mr. Malvin and Mr. Johnson, my colleagues from the region on the CTB are concerned about that. And we wanna continue to push on that and, and to continue to make you guys aware, and ladies aware that that is not gonna change unless we do something to make that change happen. So I'll leave you with that. I appreciate the time. God bless everybody. Have a great Thanksgiving. I want to thank you for that observation. And um, my my knowledge and history of the area doesn't go back a long, long way. But I do recall, and I believe it was associated with the uh, some of the roads and projects, that there was a major effort by some on the peninsula um, to fight against, uh, I think, a, a sales tax increase, I think, for funding some of the roads. So. I'm pleased to say at least that the attitude has changed, um, that individuals, particularly our legislature, are now more agreeable and amenable to doing what's necessary with respect to tax increases um, to fund the roads. And so we've made a lot of progress in that area, but thank you for reminding us that um, we're perhaps not past the problem that causes some of the backups at the tunnel, and that is the height of the tunnels to accommodate westbound tractor trailer um, vehicles that might be over height. Any other uh, comments, any other old business, new business? Well, hearing none, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you and have a happy holiday. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Bobby D, have a great one, everybody.